uh, let's start, right? So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another webinar from our Particle and Astroparticles channel. Uh, today we have with us uh, Diego Aristizabo from uh, University Universidad Técnica Federico Santa Maria in Chile. So Diego got his PhD from uh, Valencia University and then he went to a postdoc in Frascati in LNF. LNF. Uh, after that, he did another postdoc in Liège University. And now he is at the University Universidad Técnica Federico Santa Maria. Uh, his uh, field of research is beyond standard model physics, uh, with emphasis in neutrino physics, lepton flame evaluation, leptogenesis, among others. And uh, he's going to talk about today uh, about the neutrino nucleus uh, coherent elastic scattering. So it's a big pleasure to have you here, Diego, with us. Thank you a lot to, to have accepted our invitation, please. Okay, uh, well, uh, Tessio, uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction and also thank you to you, to Clarice, and also to Farinaldo for the kind invitation. Uh, okay, uh, as you said, uh, I'm gonna uh, speak about this, uh, what I regard as physical opportunities that this kind of experiments offer. So this, uh, these are experiments which are going on in, or are planned to, to start taking data soon in, in different parts of the world, including Brazil. And uh, what I want to point out in, in, in this talk is that <clears throat> uh they they offer the the possibility not only of um uh, of measuring or determining uh, trying you know to uh improve our understanding of neutrino properties but they although they provide as well uh opportunities uh to look for uh additional uh type of physics for example uh, i will try to to discuss uh, depending on how I do with time, I understand I have actually a, an hour for, for the seminar, so I will try to be efficient. And at the, in the last part of my talk, I will try to speak about, uh, you know, kind of different ways in which uh, these uh, experiments can be used, uh, not, not only, as I said, uh, uh, to pin down or to better understand neutrino properties, but also to look for uh, extra degrees of freedom. Uh, okay, so... Um, uh, I would like to start, first of all, you know, uh, uh, mentioning that these people over here are collaborators. It's, of course, they are not present, but uh, I think it's, it's fair enough, uh, uh, you know, to acknowledge, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the contributions they have done in, in various of the subjects that I'm, I'm going to discuss today. Okay, so uh, when I speak about uh, 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 neutrino physics, I, I always like to show this... Um, uh, or to emphasize that, that uh, you know, if you have a, a, an environment, an experimental environment in which you produce neutrinos, of course, you can use that environment uh, uh, to determine uh, or to better understand uh, neutrino properties, but you can also use neutrinos as a prop. And, and I think that, that this, uh, this plot over here uh, shows that uh, very much in, in detail. So here I'm, uh, I have a uh, cross-section measured in, in millibar uh, and uh, cross-section as a function of neutrino energy. So one can see that that neutrinos are present basically uh, from uh, uh, very early times uh, after electroweak uh, uh, interactions were decoupled in, in the early universe. And they are present in, in a completely different environments, such as uh, extra in, in extra galactic phenomena or in galactic phenomena as well. And uh, all this uh, this phenomena not only include this early universe uh, physics and and this uh, 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 galactic and extra galactic phenomena, but they also include uh, atmospheric. Uh, uh, neutrinos, uh, they, they involve as well supernova neutrinos, solar neutrinos, reactor neutrinos, uh, 
uh, gale neutrinos as well. So you you probably uh, can. Uh, it's difficult to think uh, of uh, of an environment in which you don't have neutrinos. And as I said, if you are able to to measure these neutrinos from whatever environment they were produced, then you can test the hypotheses that lie behind our understanding of those environments. And it's from that point of view that I, I believe that it's hard to think of, of any other particle, at least those that, that we know exist uh, with such uh, features. Now for the talk uh, of today, I'm gonna focus on neutrinos in this uh, energy range. So about uh, solar and, and reactor uh, uh, neutrino uh, energies, which are energies of uh, ranging from few MeV up to say uh, 100 MeV or so. So I'm including in that discussion, of course, neutrinos produced in what is called uh, fixed uh, target experiments. Okay, what do I refer, uh, what do I mean when I when I say coherent elastic neutrino nucleus is scattering? And I'm insisting on that in, in the following sense. So I want to use this process uh, not only to understand neutrino properties, actually I, I would like to use this process uh, to uh, as a probe that will enable me uh, uh, to test uh, whether, for example, there are new degrees of freedom uh, lurking somehow, uh, which have been never uh, been observed for, for a reason that we, we still don't understand. Now, coherent elastic neutrino nucleus scattering is a process uh, in which the individual uh, nucleon amplitudes uh, end up summing uh, coherently and therefore produce a, a large enhancement uh, of the corresponding uh, cross section. For this to be the case, uh, there's a condition that uh, should be satisfied. So we are speaking about uh, a, a quantum mechanical uh, process. So the condition for this to happen uh, relates with to the De Broglie wavelength. Whenever the De Broglie uh, wavelength is larger than the nuclear radius, then you have coherent enhancement of, of the process. And, and this condition you can translate in terms of the uh, momentum exchanged. So this condition for a typical uh, uh, nuclear radius uh, is satisfied whenever uh, the momentum exchange is below say 200 MeV or so. So that information provides, uh, or this bound provides information on, on the largest uh, recoil energy that you can get in a particular nuclear isotope. And when you plug in here a, a typical nuclear isotope, I'm, I'm thinking about, for example, xenon, then you can determine an upper bound on the, on the neutrino energy that will induce uh, such a process. So uh, neutrinos uh, with energies below 100 MeV, so to say, uh, this, this is a rough number, of course, uh, will induce uh, coherent elastic neutrino nucleus scattering. Now, the cross-section for this process was calculated a uh, long time ago. Back in 1974, Friedman calculated the cross-section. The cross-section actually has a pretty uh, simple structure. So it involves uh, this quantity over here, which contains information on electroweak parameters, in particular about the weak mixing angle, and of course contains information as well on the uh, nuclear isotope that you are using as, as a target. And then since you are scattering off uh, a non-fundamental object, a nucleus, uh, you have to include as well, uh, sorry, you have to include as well uh, a form factor. Uh, the form factor that people like to use is uh, for this kind of calculations is, it was uh, pointed out uh, actually even way before then, then Friedman calculated the cross section back in 1956. And this is how it looks like for uh, two different isotopes of xenon and germanium. The downward spikes over here indicate the point where uh, coherence is fully lost. So of course, uh, as you increase recoil energy, uh, there's a point at which uh, neutrinos start uh, uh, speaking, so to say, with the nucleons rather than with the, with the nucleus. Okay, uh, the process, despite being uh, uh, the cross-section being calculated to, 
uh, almost 50 years ago. The process was observed only just uh, three years ago by the coherent collaboration. Um, now, coherent uses neutrinos produced at the Spallation Neutron Source in Park Ridge uh, National Laboratory in Tennessee. What they do is that they collide protons against uh, a fixed uh, mercury target. Of course, uh, they do that not to produce neutrinos, they do that uh, to produce neutrons. It's an Spallation Neutron Source. But a byproduct of that, uh, of that collision uh, is, uh, uh, as a byproduct of that collision, you always get uh, pions. So these pions, they decay to mu neutrinos. And the anti-muons, which are produced in that process, uh, produce as well uh, further neutrinos, produce electron neutrinos and anti-muon neutrinos. So the flux that you get in, in, in at the spallation neutron source consists of three components, three neutrino components, uh, one uh, muon flavor, another electron flavor, and another, and another flavor, anti-muon uh, flavor. Now, the conclusion of the collaboration back in 2017 was that sevens uh, the presence of sevens is favored at the 6.7 sigma level, and the data was consistent with the standard model at the one sigma level. So here, uh, what I'm showing is the, the data points uh, measured by the collaboration back in 2017, and uh, I'm overlapping that with the standard model prediction. So the histograms over here, the blue, green, and red ones are for uh, the muon, the anti-muon, and the electron uh, flavor uh, neutrino fluxes. And the black histogram is what you get when you add up all these uh, three contributions. So you can see from this, uh, from this result, so this is a number of photoelectrons, uh, and this is counts uh, uh, using beans of size two photoelectrons. So uh, you can see that that the points, the data points, they they pretty much follow the standard model predictions. Of course, with uh, with certain uh, with certain deviations. Um, okay, uh, this year as well, uh, uh, in March, the collaboration uh, reported uh, further measurements of this process uh, using uh, the uh, a liquid argon detector. So I didn't mention that probably. But this measurement was done using a cesium iodide detector. Uh, the data released uh, back in March this year uh, was done using uh, a liquid argon detector, which I will I'll go into the, into the details of that further uh, later on. Now, as I said, <clears throat> uh, there are various opportunities that uh, this process, in particular, this kind of experiments offer. Uh, and you can split uh, the opportunities in probably two categories, uh, a category which involves standard physics and a category that is a bit more speculative uh, that involves uh, uh, the possibility of uh, looking for new physics in, in, in these facilities. Now, uh, standard physics, uh, I mean, uh, for example, determination of nuclear properties, such as the root mean square radius of neutron distributions. Now, this information is useful because it enables uh, the determination of, of the neutron skin, which is crucial uh, in the equation of a state of neutron stars, which people are uh, right now uh, uh, considering. So this uh, work along these lines was done right away. The data was released uh, back in, in 2017 by Juntian collaborators. Now, within this category as well, uh, one can speak about uh, further improvements of uh, of our understanding of electroweak parameters, of which uh, uh, the determination of the weak mixing angle at the one MeV renormalization scale is, is possible. This is a possibility considered uh, a couple of years ago by Miranda and, and his collaborators. And then when it goes to non-standard physics, there's a, a variety of scenarios that people have considered uh, based on the, on the assumption that you might have uh, new states or new forces which are somehow lurking there, but that people uh, have not been able for some reason uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to detect. So these possibilities involve um, light fermions, for example, sterile neutrinos. So this is a possibility that I consider uh, 
last year in collaboration with Jajun uh, uh, Liao and Danny Marfatia. And then uh, uh, another possibility that people have considered is the presence of new force and, for example, the form of light uh, vector or scalar uh, mediators. And, and this is uh, an, actually a, an incomplete list of, of people that have looked into uh, that kind of possibility. Now, of course, if one wants to do analysis of this type, the first thing that one has to understand is uh, what kind of uh, environments are suitable uh, for the study of, uh, of sevens. So I'm referring to the process of sevens, uh, of coherent elastic neutrino nucleus scattering uh, seven. So it's kind of a, the jargon that people use in this kind of business. Now the environments uh, um, I'm speaking about are, are kind of over here. Uh, there are other environments, uh, but these are more, uh, are less plausible, so to say. So uh, I'm considering uh, reactor neutrinos, uh, well, uh, fixed target neutrinos, uh, as it happens in, in coherent, and also kind of astrophysical neutrinos, those coming from the sun, eventually those coming from uh, diffuse supernova background neutrinos, atmospheric neutrinos as well, uh, are possible sources for, for uh, coherent elastic neutrino nucleus scattering for sevens. Of course, atmospheric, I'm speaking about sub-GV atmospheric neutrinos because otherwise atmospheric neutrinos will, will, uh, will not induce uh, the process. Now, uh, reactor neutrino facilities are used by a variety of experiments, including CONUS, and as I said, CONI in, in Brazil aims at, at using uh, at reactor neutrinos. Uh, fixed target experiments, so far, the only experiment which relies on this kind of uh, production, neutrino production mechanism for sevens is coherent. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, the, the spectrum uh, or the spectra involves uh, uh, two continuous components, anti muon antineutrinos and electron neutrinos, and of course, a monochromatic line that comes from, from pi, from stopped uh, pi, and so from pi at rest. And then uh, in solar uh, neutrinos, of course, we have uh, all this kind of, uh, of fluxes coming from the from the PP chain and, and also from the CNO chain. Now, uh, most of uh, of searches that can be done, actually, all the searches that, that can be done for sevens using this kind of of neutrinos uh, rely on uh, direct detection uh, dark matter. Uh, detectors, uh, multi-tone size uh, detectors such as Xenon 1T or, or Generation 3 detectors such as Darwin. So all of them uh, will be using uh, thresholds of about 1 kV, probably below, but never way below 1 kV. And that basically uh, limits those uh, searches or, or those measurements to fluxes dominated by boron-8. And at least uh, from the next uh, 10 years, there is no way one can, one can look for sevens induced by atmospheric neutrinos, given that uh, the, the, the flux is, is way suppressed compared with boron-8. Now, as I said, there is a, a kind of, I would say, a big interest in this process, probably because of the reasons I, I already mentioned. Uh, and this is probably demonstrated by, by this map over here. So this map shows uh, different uh, facilities worldwide that are aiming at, uh, at measuring or that have already measured uh, this process. So CONI in Brazil uh, is, uh, will start at some point to take data. Minor in Texas as well, at some point will start taking data. So this is a reactor experiment. This one is a reactor experiment too. Coherent that I already kind of described. And uh, so this is in the Americas. And then in Western Europe, you have CONUS in Germany, also Nucleus in Germany. Both are reactor uh, related experiments. Ricochet in, in France. 
And then you have in Russia, new gene and red, that sometimes they call it red hundred, uh, depending on, 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 the, on, on the detector they are, they are thinking about. But okay, let's, let's say red in, in Russia, new gene. And Texono, so Texono is, uh, is in Taiwan. It's a facility that has been already running for a while, uh, but uh, they, they ran uh, looking for different processes. For example, neutrino electron scattering. And they also did a dedicated search for actual light particles. This is a reactor experiment, but they, they plan as well uh, to look for coherent elastic neutrino nucleus scattering. Now this is a kind of uh, the most uh, <clears throat> advanced projects in, in the planet. But there have been also uh, recently uh, interest in, in, in this process in Argentina. So the Argentinians uh, have uh, already done some uh, R&D for, for a detector called Violeta that uh, uh, stands for this, uh, for this uh, neutrino interaction observation with a low energy threshold array. The Mexicans as well, they, they, they are designing uh, an experiment called the scintillation bubble chamber. For Violeta, there's, a sti there's already uh, some, uh, some work uh, in public works, so public uh, papers that one, can, that one can read for the scintillation bubble chamber. There's still nothing public, but I understand they are working on a kind of uh, uh, R&D report. Now in Belgium, uh, they also have a plan to construct uh, uh, this detector solid. Uh, here I want to stress that all these detectors apart from solid are detectors which are designed for, for measuring uh, coherent elastic neutrino nucleus scattering. Solid instead is a detector which uh, uh, has been conceived uh, primarily for the search of sterile neutrinos so it collide. So the idea is is to use a nuclear power plant in Belgium and uh, and use hydrogen as a target with a base with a very short baseline, a baseline which is is no no longer than no larger, sorry, than than two meters or so. Uh, the reason why I'm mentioning solid is because at the end of my talk I will I will speak about uh, searches for actual like particles which can be carried on uh, on this on this detector as well. And then uh, there's another project. This one is uh, sevens related, uh, which will uh, be constructed in South Korea. It's called Neon, uh, using uh, sodium iodide crystals. Okay. Now, of course, in this list, I'm including only uh, detectors which are, are dedicated, so dedicated uh, sevens detectors. But uh, among that list, one uh, can probably uh, extend the list by by including multitone dark matter detectors so uh when i say multitone dark matter detectors i'm i'm mainly considering uh sino one t which has already produced some some sort of data in both uh, nuclear and electron recoils uh the upgrade that will start taking data probably in in, in a couple of years from now seen on nt and then uh, an upgrade of Xenon NT uh, Darwin, which is generation three uh, uh, dark matter detector, which will employ um, uh, 50 tons of Xenon with a fiducial uh, uh, 40 ton, uh, uh, no, 30, 30 tons, sorry. So, so it depends on, on, on who you speak with. Sometimes, you know, you speak with, uh, with people from the co from the collaboration, uh, they tell you thirty, they tell you forty. So, but that's the ball. The ballpark number is this one. So, the fiducial volume is about thirty tons. Of course, these detectors were not are not constructed uh, primarily for for detection of sevens. But anyway, they will face the background, and uh, so the the these detectors can be used for neutrino detection and and the the process that will be apart from neutrino electron scattering that will dominate. Uh, <coughs> neutrino detection will be seven. So at Darwin, you expect thousands of, of sevens events. Uh, so this is uh, a, a, uh, an experiment taking place in, uh, in, in, in Gran Sasso, in, in L'Aquila, in, in, in Italy. So Sino-1T, Sino-1T, and Darwin. 
Now, in the US, uh, they have this uh, Black Zeppelin, which probably will start taking data in a couple of years or so. It's located in South Dakota in the Sanford Underground Research Facility. Uh, and it's pretty comparable to Xenon NT. So Xenon NT will also observe sevens, and of course, Lux Zeppelin will do so. As I mentioned, Xenon Wonton has already observed uh, neutrino electron scattering, uh, but that's not as spectacular as, as, uh, as sevens, in my opinion, because elect, uh, elastic no uh, electron, uh, neutrino electron scattering has been observed as well by other experiments, such as Borexino. <coughs> But they, already, but they already have uh, observed seven, so they already have a few data in, in the sevens channel using nuclear recoil. So this is uh, uh, the data that I digitized from, from this paper from, from last year. Okay, so let me go back to, to sevens. So uh, uh, as I, just because I want to tell you about the detectors that are operating there and about the specifications that these detectors involve. Mm. So as I said, neutrino layers, they are, are producing the spallation neutron source. So the spallation neutron source, of course, is not, was not built to produce neutrinos, was built to produce neutrons, but a byproduct of all the process is, uh, are neutrinos. No? So they have a proton beam, as I said, that, that they collide against a, mercury fi a fixed mercury target, and they produce neutrinos. They have for detectors, uh, cesium iodide, with which the, the first detection was, uh, was uh, the first measurement of sevens was done. Liquid argon, uh, with which uh, uh, data was released, or second measurement was done. And then they have a uh, sodium iodide detector and they have a germanium detector. And these are the specifications of this, of this detector. So these are the technologies. This is the mass of, uh, of, of ongoing experiments for germanium and for sodium iodide. Uh, uh, the number is here, 185 kilograms, so about 200 kilograms. They have plans for upgrading uh, this detector uh, to two tons, as well as they have plans to upgrade this detector to one ton. Of course, if you upgrade to, to one ton, given the baselines that we are uh, speaking about here. So these are baselines which barely exceed uh, 30 meters. So you will have uh, uh, a lot of statistics with which, uh, so to say, a lot of fun one can have. And then you have over here uh, the sensitivities of the detector. So the recoil of energy thresholds for the cesium, germanium, and liquid argon and sodium iodide. Okay. Now, as, as for reactors, uh, this is the status. So this, uh, these experiments are more, uh, are kind of plenty, you know. So there's uh, <coughs> uh, in, in the map. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. May I uh, ask a quick question about the previous slide? Yeah. So uh, in different runs of the coherent experiment, they use different targets. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and the one that uh, actually observed the, the the first made the, the, the first measurement was using which target? Okay, so uh, at the beginning when they started taking data uh, back in 2016, the these three detectors were not operative as far as I understand. The only one that was operative was the cesium iodide detector. So that's the reason why uh, the first measurement was done uh, with uh, the cesium iodide detector. Mm -hmm. Currently, uh, this detector, as far as I understand, has been, uh, is not operating anymore, but they are still taking data with this one for which there's data already, and they are taking data with this one and this one too. Okay, so they run the experiment. So uh, you, you have, uh, so the, the main goal of the spallation neutron source of the spallation neutron source is, is neutron production. So the, the spallation neutron source runs, and as I said, as a byproduct, you end up producing neutrinos. You have three detectors, the, the, the three detectors, independent detectors will register different signals. So that's basically the point. Okay, okay, I see. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let me go back to, uh, to reactor-based experiments. Uh, now, as I said, th th this, uh, there's a, quite a few number of, uh, of, 
of uh, of this kind of experiments, uh, of which uh, the only one which is currently taking data is Konus in Germany, okay, um, which uses uh, one kilogram of of uh, of germanium. Now one can sort these experiments according to the technology the detectors use, and there are kind of uh, five uh, technologies that one can differentiate. So detectors using semiconductor, well, basically detectors relying on ionization, detectors using uh, or based on low temperature bolometers, uh, detectors uh, relying on liquid novel gas uh, technologies or TPCs, and then detectors uh, using uh, what is called charge coupled devices, CCDs. And then uh, detectors uh, whose principle of operation is scintillation. Now, the first group, uh, you find Texona, Konus, and Nugin. So this is the Russian experiment. This is the uh, experiment in Taiwan. And, and this is the experiment in Germany. Uh, in the second category, you find minor, uh, Nucleus, and Ricochet. Uh, this one in France, as I mentioned, this one in, in, in the US, and this other one in Germany. Uh, those relying on, on TPC technologies, uh, on TPC technologies, sorry, uh, Red 100 in Russia and the scintillation bubble chamber in Mexico. Uh, the scintillation bubble chamber in Mexico actually uh, used uh, kind of the same technology that PICO, which is our dark matter detector in, in, in this no lab in, in Canada, uh, is using. And then uh, CCDs will be used by Coney and, and Violetta. And these others will solid, solid, and and neon fall in this in these other categories. So these are the specifications. You know, it's like uh, I just brought this for uh, kind of general information. My important point here is that you can see distance between uh, production and detection never exceeds uh, more than thirty meters <coughs> apart from from ricochet. Uh, ricochet they can they can afford having a, a a longer baseline because the power there is a factor eight power uh, the the so they're using a different uh, uh, nuclear reactors uh, which uh, if you take into account the power of, of the individual uh, nuclear power plants you summon them up you you end up with a number which is about eight gigawatts okay this other thing instead for example minor uh it uses uh, uh, a research uh, reactor in 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 the University of Texas A&M, uh, which is one megawatt. So you have to somehow compensate for the decrease of of power, and you do that by by decreasing the the baseline. So they plan at some point to take data at one meter from from the source. Okay, so that's basically the, 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 the part that I wanted to cover uh, regarding uh, uh, experiments. And now I want to go uh, to, to cases in, in which uh, uh, one, one can use uh, either the process or the facilities uh, to look for, for new physics. Now, the point with this discussion is that, uh, as you have seen, there's too many experimental environments. And on top of that, on top of that, there is also a lot of physics scenarios that one could consider. So, of course, I cannot cover all of them in an hour. What I did was selecting a few cases uh, with some bias, of course. Uh, so these are cases that I have uh, studied myself. So CP violating uh, new physics at coherent. Uh, that's the first thing that I would like to discuss. Uh, hum. Uh, tell you how am I doing with time? Uh, yeah, don't worry. We have uh, a certain uh, flexibility about time, but let's yeah. say 20, 20 minutes more. Like 20, min 20 minutes more. Okay. Okay. So, okay. I thought. Uh, I thought that I could discuss then these three possibilities, but given the the, the amount of time, twenty minutes won't be sufficient to discuss them three. Well, let me see how how I, I do at least with the first uh, with the first part. Okay, and then um, uh, the other possibility which uh, I would like to discuss is is uh, a work I I I, I did this uh, this year. Uh, 
on the sensitivities of neutrino magnetic dipole moments and multiton dark matter detectors, in particular in CNO1, T, CNO1, and T, and Darwin. And then uh, the the last part, uh, and this is a part which I I would like uh, to to discuss. So I can probably drop this one, but this one I I would like to to drop is the possibility of of use facilities not for neutrino physics but for actual light particle searches at reactor based experiments <clears throat> such as conus minor those that I mentioned already. This is a, actually a paper that I that I wrote uh, uh, last month. So this is a, a paper written in collaboration with these people over here. This one written with one of my students and, uh, and, and collaborators of mine here. And this written as well with uh, collaborators of mine. Okay, so let me go to the case of CP violating uh, new physics at coherent. Now in this case, <coughs> uh, briefly, you know, briefly speaking, what we did was considering a, a light vector uh, mediator, you know, as an example of what could be done uh, in if you if you aim at looking to CP violating effects in this kind of, uh, of environments. Now, at first sight, when you think about looking to CP violation in this kind of environment, it looks like pretty challenging because when, when you look and people uh, try to, to study uh, CP violating effects, Typically, they rely uh, on asymmetries. Uh, uh, so you you consider, for example, cross sections, and you consider the cross section uh, to uh, final states, and cross section and the corresponding cross sections to anti-final states. Now, in this case, you, you cannot you cannot do that because you cannot arrange uh, uh, the nucleus to be in in an anti-final state, so to say. Uh, so it's kind of challenging. So uh, we thought, okay, what could be done? And I, I will try to to point out uh, what was uh, our strategy. You know, to try to pin down whether if you have a new signal, uh, uh, the new signal comes along with CP violation. So this is the process that we consider. You know, we 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 just uh, took this one as an example. So a new light vector mediator. Uh, whose couplings to neutrinos uh, look this way. So you have a vector and an axial current. And then you have a couplings to quarks for which we only consider the vector uh, uh, current, given that the actual quark current <coughs> will lead to speed suppressed effects. So in general, you expect this, this current to be, to dominate over the, the, the spin dependent piece. Now, if you if you argue that that this vector is charged under a, a given BSM symmetry group, could be, for example, a, a, a dark sector group, then uh, you could argue that these couplings come along with phases, and in general, you, you will have uh, twice the number of couplings you have here. So you have four couplings, and if they are complex, you have these couplings twice. So you have eight uh, free couplings. And on top of that, you, you will have the mass of, of, of the vector. Now, if you calculate the cross section in this case, so you have, uh, of course, you have interference. Uh, uh, so the new piece uh, will interfere with the standard model uh, contribution. That interference can be constructive or destructive, depending on, on the relative sign between the two contributions. But the important point is uh, here is the following. So you get this combination in, in, in the BSM piece, but that combination involves uh, your complex parameters. So when you look to this expression, you see that you have eight parameters, you have uh, four moduli, you have four phases, you have eight parameters plus the vector boson mass. So you say, okay, if I'm gonna run an exercise of this type, then I will I will probably need uh, a lot of uh, CPU power. But then you realize that that this piece over here is just a complex number that you can always parameterize uh, as a modulus times a phase, and in that way you can reduce uh, you know the multi-parameter problem to a kind of more friendly problem, which involves just three parameters: the mass of the of the mediator, the modulus uh, of whatever you have here, uh, and the phase. Of course, if you do that, uh, at some point you have to do a mapping. So you have to do the mapping between this, uh, what, what you get for these couplings and the fundamental couplings, whatever those couplings are. And uh, 
in principle, you can do a reconstruction. So given information on these two uh, uh, parameters, you can do a reconstruction, but of course you expect uh, degeneracies in that case. There's no way you can avoid this degeneracies for a simple reason. You have, a, 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 you have one measurement that you can regard, for example, as the event spectrum, and you have nine parameters. So you are trying to reconstruct a parameter space using a single measurement a parameter space a space which spans uh, nine dimensions so you of course expect the generacies now if you want to you know to try to identify uh, cp violating effects well you have to find uh you have to define a, a criteria uh, in order to do so and, and the criteria that that we used actually it's a single criterion is rather simple you know that the standard model contribution the cp conserving okay so if the standard model contribution cancels exactly for a given recoil energy, the, the new contribution, you know for sure that the new contribution will be CP conserving. Now that condition you can translate into a, com into a relation between uh, the new coupling, the vector boson mass and the recoil energy, which all over depends on the type of isotope you are using as target. Okay. Now, uh, in doing so, in using this expression, you can then uh, map uh, into a, a plane, coupling versus mass. And uh, it turns out that you can split this plane into two pieces, which are pretty uh, distinctive. Uh, a piece or a region where the recoil spectrum always involve a deep in a zone where you don't have any deep. Okay, this means that if you observe a deep in the spectrum, you will be for sure, uh, for sure you can tell that you have new physics and that the new physics is CP conserving. Okay, now using this criteria then, uh, you can do the following. So this, this is what we did. We, we took the, the sodium iodide detector at coherent, uh, assuming the two tons, okay? These two tons we assume just to assure uh, sufficient statistics. Uh, so somehow this is a forecast of what could be done in the near future in the sodium iodide detector at coherent. Now, uh, in here, uh, I have the, the vent spectrum calculated for uh, CP conserving, for the CP conserving case, uh, which produces a deep at about uh, 30 keV. So you can see that uh, as soon as I switch on one phase or the phase, I start having departures from the deep, which means that departures from the deep provide information on the amount of CP violation that I have. Now, in order to test or in order to measure the sensitivities that the sodium iodide detector uh, uh, would have uh, to CP violation, what we did was running a self experiment in which we took as, uh, as input, as uh, so to say, experimental data uh, on a spectrum with a deep. So we took a spectrum with a deep, we took that as, uh, as our experimental input. And then we ran uh, a chi-square analysis, and this is the result of our uh, of our um, chi-square analysis. What we did for this chi-square analysis was uh, scanning over phase in uh, vector boson mass, keeping the the coupling HV uh, fixed. This just for simplicity. Now you can see that uh, if this is the case, if you get a spectrum which uh, involves a deep then it's not that, uh, that you can just uh, rule out the possibility of having CP violation, but you can place a pretty tight bounds on the amount of CP violation that that uh, new physics will come along with. So for the numerical case that, that we consider, you can see that if this is the case, you will be able uh, to set bounds uh, on the CP violating phase at the, say, one sigma level uh, for phi 
uh, in between minus pi over 60 and pi over 60. So you cannot rule out the possibility of the of the new physics involving CP violation, but you can place pretty stringent bounds. Okay. Uh, there's another part to this exercise, but I, I probably will skip this one and move to the to the other uh, uh, subject I want to discuss, which is neutrino magnetic moments in in, in dark matter detectors. Uh, and here I, I will just uh, you know spend a couple of minutes with some sort of uh, introductions for those of you which are not familiar with the subject. Now, uh, the neutrino electromagnetic current can be parameterized in a rather generic way uh, in this form. It's actually an exercise that was done a long time ago, back in 1982, by Kayser and, and Nieves. It can be uh, written in terms of uh, uh, four different form factors, FQ, FA, uh, FM, and FE. And the uh, zero uh, exchange momentum limit, these four factors uh, match the what will be the, the neutrino charge, electric charge for FQ. FM will be, and, and that limit corresponds to uh, what people call the neutrino magnetic moment or neutrino uh, magnetic dipole moment. FA uh, matches in that limit the anapole moment and if E matches the, or defines actually the uh, electric dipole moment. Now I can derive a few properties of this, uh, of these four factors in a completely model independent fashion. It was done by, by, by these uh, two folks over here. Uh, <clears throat> for the diagonal components of these four factors, in the case of uh, of Dirac neutrinos, all of them are different from zero apart from uh, from Fe. Fe. Fe is equal to zero, assuming the new physics that accounts for this uh, <coughs> for this coupling um, is CP conserving. For the Majorana case, is the other way around. The only uh, non-vanishing uh, foreign factor is the one associated with uh, with the anapole moment. All the others vanish. For off-diagonal uh, form factors, um, all of them are different from zero in both cases, Dirac and Majorana, and they are typically referred to in the literature as transitions. <clears throat> now, these couplings are subject to quite a few number of constraints uh, that one can probably split into groups. Uh, the first constraints come from astrophysical criteria. Mm. The second constraints come from laboratory searches. So let me just give you a kind of a glimpse of uh, how the astrophysical bounds uh, are derived and look like. Uh, uh, the most important bounds come from uh, <clears throat> supernova uh, arguments, uh, in particular uh, from the argument behind the disruption uh, of the neutrino uh, diffusion time. So during a a short period of time, about 10 seconds, neutrinos are trapped uh, within uh, the supernova, um, the supernova explosion core. Uh, if you have a new interaction <clears throat> which uh, produces a spleen flip scattering, then you will be producing right-handed neutrinos. And uh, those right-handed neutrinos, uh, they are not subject to electroweak interactions. They are singlets and therefore they can escape that environment and therefore disrupt uh, the, the diffusion time. So constraints coming from this uh, criteria were derived a long time ago by Raffel in 1990, and they, they, they imply a pretty stringent bound on the neutrino magnetic moment of order 10 to the minus 12 uh, Bohr magnetons. And the other criteria that one can use uh, follows from uh, <clears throat> global, global or cluster stars. Now, in that environment, you can think of the photon as having an effective mass. Uh, it's actually what is called a plasmon. So the plasmon uh, can decay to a neutrino pair, and, and this neutrino pair can escape the, the, the stellar environment and induce uh, stellar cooling. 
So a stellar cooling arguments uh, imply uh, an upper bound on the neutrino magnetic moment, which is pretty comparable to what you get from uh, supernova criteria. So th this is the number, uh, as far as I know, the, the most uh, fresh number that you can find in the literature uh, last year derived by, by these folks over here. Now, uh, this is my, my, probably my take on, uh, on these bounds. So it's my view, my, my personal understanding. Now, these bounds uh, come along with hypotheses and they come along as well with uh, kind of large uncertainties. So it's not that one has to take these numbers as, uh, as if they were the last word. So if you have a nice prediction, which requires a number which is comparable uh, to these numbers, uh, I, will dis I won't uh, discard that prediction because uh, astrophysical arguments tell me that I should do. So this is more like a kind of an order of magnitude uh, of what these bounds look like. More robust bounds come from laboratory searches because in there you have a completely uh, under control environment. So you're under control of basically everything. You know the backgrounds, you know the production mechanisms, you know the detection mechanisms. So, so you have under control all, all the variables and, and therefore these limits are way more robust. Uh, regarding uh, neutrino magnetic moments, um, those which are more stringent come from a neutrino electron uh, elastic scattering using either solar neutrinos or reactor neutrino <coughs> uh, fluxes. So Texono and Gemma, they use uh, reactor neutrino fluxes while Borexino and Camland use solar neutrino fluxes. So Borexino uh, is sens or was sensitive even to the, to the PP uh, neutrino flux. Now uh, of these couplings, sorry, of these limits, so these are 90% confidence limits. Those which are more competitive, the most stringent ones come from Borexino and Gamma and amount to about three times 10 to the minus 11 Bohr magnetons. Now, um, this, this couplings, they contribute, uh, of course, to both uh, nuclear recoils and electron recoils. They contribute uh, to sevens and they contribute to uh, neutrino electron scattering. The cross sections look like this, this for sevens, calculated also a long time ago by Vogel and Engel back in 1989. And for neutrino electron scattering, have, it has the same structure that, that for uh, neutrino nucleus, but of course, with the absence of the nuclear Ford factor. Now, the point here, and actually was the, the motivation for what we did, was that if you have a detector which is sensitive to nuclear recoils and, and electron recoils, then, then you can have a nice interplay. So you have two observables now. So you have the, the, the event spectrum uh, for electron recoils, and you have the event spectrum uh, for nuclear recoils. So you have two observables, you have more power. And, and that and that environment is provided actually by, by dark matter experiments. So uh, multiton dark matter detectors are sensitive to both, to uh, nuclear recoils and electron recoils. And this is how uh, the standard model uh, prediction looks like. So this is uh, the standard model prediction for, for, uh, for nuclear recoils, the upper uh, plot. The lower plot is that is the standard model prediction for for electron recoils. In this case, the signal, as I said already, uh, is dominated by boron-8 and covers uh, energies up to 4 kV or so. Therefore, uh, this kind of, uh, of spectrum is, is pretty sensitive to the thresholds that, that you use. If you move on from 1 to 0.3 uh, kV or you move to 1, to 2 kV, then you deplete uh, the, the signal. If you rather go to lower thresholds, you enhance the signal. So it's pretty sensitive to the, to the thresholds that, that the detector uses. For electron recoils, it doesn't work that, that, doesn't work that way, uh, basically because the, the energies you have access to span about two orders of magnitude. So you can uh, probably pay a penalty of, uh, of a factor two or three, no, not, not a factor, sorry, uh, 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 you can decrease uh, thresholds uh, from one to two to three kV, basically without noting uh, the difference in the in the event spectrum. Now, uh, using this information, taking this as, as an input, 
you know, running a, a kind of toy experiment. What we did was a chi-square analysis. And these are the results of that chi-square analysis, which enable us uh, to determine the sensitivities of, of three possible detectors. One detector with, uh, with a fiducial uh, uh, volume of one ton, another one with a fiducial volume of 10 tons, and another one with a fiducial volume of 40 tons. So these uh, three detectors have not been precisely seen on one T, seen on NT, and Darwin are pretty representative of what these uh, detectors will be sensitive to. So this is uh, uh, the result that we regard as, you know, kind of optimistic result because it relies uh, on, on, on a very conservative, uh, no, sorry, very aggressive background hypothesis plus a kind of aggressive uh, recoil threshold, 0.3 kV. So what is interesting here is that you can see that when you go to the 40 ton detector, you already get numbers uh, on the neutrino magnetic moments. So you have sensitivities to the neutrino magnetic moments, which are pretty comparable to what Borixino and Gamma got. So you will say, okay, what's the point? You are getting the same number that Borixino and Gamma got. Yeah, but you have to bear in mind that Borixino and Gamma, they were using neutrino electron scattering. Here we are speaking about sensitivities at the nuclear level. So these numbers are way better than what Borixino and, and, uh, and Gamma uh, got if you move on to electron recoils. And this is how it looks for electron recoils with the same, for, for the same detectors. So if you go and look to the 40 ton detector, you see that you are already visiting regions which are pretty comparable to the regions that in principle astrophysical arguments rule out. And this is pretty interesting because it means that in this kind of environment, you will be able uh, to visit uh, or to test regions uh, where some uh, TV related uh, uh, new physics scenarios predict these uh, neutrino magnetic moments uh, to be different from zero. So it, it might be that they get lucky and they, and they, and they get a signal uh, related with this kind of physics. <clears throat> okay, Tessio, uh, am I allowed uh, to to spend like five or six minutes more? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, so this drives me to the last part of my talk. Uh, as I said, this is a work that I finished last uh, month, so that's one of the reasons why I thought it was worth discussing this here. But, but also because I think that it's nice because uh, uh, so far I have discussed uh, this connection between uh, uh, sevens related experiments and what is obvious is kind of physics that you can do there. So you can look uh, to physics uh, that somehow relates with neutrinos. So your new physics somehow is coupling to the neutrino sector. But now I'm, I'm kind of changing gears in the sense that um, um, I'm not going to speak about that anymore. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, argue that that you can use these facilities for searches which are entirely independent of uh, of uh, of neutrinos are entirely independent, the couple from from neutrino physics. Uh, the main observation is the following. So uh, of course, in, in nuclear reactor plants you produce a lot of stuff. You produce a bunch of neutrinos, you produce a bunch of neutrons, but you also produce a bunch of light. Okay, so you produce photons in, in, in nuclear uh, power plants through different uh, production mechanisms. Uh, so you produce photons th through prom fission, but you can also produce uh, photons uh, through beta decay of fission products or radiative uh, uh, neutron capture, inelastic neutron capture, and so on and so forth. I mean, I can keep going with the list. So the possible mechanisms that, that produce photons in a reactor uh, is large, are large, sorry. Uh, the typical uh, photon flux that, that you have, sorry, in a, in a reactor is like this. So this follows from a, an analytical expression that was derived a long time ago in 1984 using data from the FR, FRJ1 uh, reactor, uh, uh, reactor power plant. 
which is actually a reactor that is already dismantled, was dismantled, I think, like uh, probably 10 or 15 years ago in Germany. Now, uh, you can see in, in, in this plot that the amount of, uh, of photons that you expect, so this is uh, photon flux and, and, and MeV per second as a function of, uh, of uh, photon, uh, photon energy is huge. Now, the point is the following. So you produce this guy, so you produce the photons, and the photons interact with whatever material you have there. The, mo the most abundant material there might be probably, uh, you can argue, is uranium-235, uh, so the fuel. So the gammas, they interact with the fuel, and they interact, and, and the processes that, that drive that, that interaction, you, you can sort in, in, five, in five different processes. So you have uh, Rayleigh scattering, which is actually elastic scattering, so it is uh, gamma elastic scattering. You have uh, quantum scattering, which is actually inelastic scattering. And, and then you have photoelectric absorption. And you have additional two other processes, which are electron pair production in either the electron or the, the nucleus field. Okay. Now the cross section for this uh, for these processes uh, is well known. Uh, I'm showing here the the total cross section as a function of of photon energy uh, measured in MeV <coughs> for the different components. Just to show you that uh, photoelectric absorption is relevant if you are able uh, to observe low energy photons. So for energy photons uh, say below one uh not one but probably a, a bit lower so there's a point at which photoelectric absorption dominates by far the cross section but typically at low at low energies then uh quantum scattering you see it dominates at high at high energies actually there's a point at which it overpasses the photoelectric uh, absorption contribution, while Rayleigh uh, is kind of subdominant all over the place. And then you have this other two, which uh, basically play a, a minor role, in particular, uh, the one which involves electron pair production in the electron uh, field. Now, if you have uh, actual light particles, uh, couplings, there's a fraction of these photons that can be converted into actual light particles, and therefore, uh, that will imply that in this in this nuclear reactor plant, what you have is kind of, uh, so to say, uh, an ALP factory. So you, you have a bunch of photons, but a fraction of them can be converted into actual light particles. Okay, so that, that, this is uh, for those which are not familiar with actual light particles. So I have just, you know, a very brief definition of what these particles are. You can very roughly dis uh, describe or define them as pseudo nambu Goldstone bosons, which appear in, in, in 30s beyond the standard model in which uh, global symmetries are spontaneously broken. You can, roughly speaking, define these objects this way. Now, the type of couplings that you can uh, consider, at least in, 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 in nuclear reactor environments, are couplings to radiation, couplings to electrons and coupling to nucleus, protons and, and, and neutrons. Now, if you have these couplings, uh, you can induce uh, these kind of processes. So you can induce uh, Primakov scattering. So you have now your light, which, which is interacting with the fuel, but it's not producing a photon, it's producing an action like particle, if you have this coupling. If you have this other coupling, well, you will have as well uh, the radiation interacting with the fuel, which at the end will end up producing uh, an action like particle. And if you have this coupling over here, uh, you will end up uh, producing action like particles via uh, nuclear excitation. So the point is <clears throat> you have a photon that hits a nucleus, the nucleus gets excited and at some point will uh, will produce a, will go to the ground state. When it goes to the ground state in the absence of these couplings, it will emit a gamma ray, but now we have a new coupling that enables you to produce this guy as well. 
Now you expect the, the, the flux coming from, from this uh, kind of processes to be monochromatic, of course, because it, it, the, the ALP is producing, you know, in a quantum, uh, in a quantum transition. So the, the ALP will be produced with a, with, with a definitive energy determined by, by the gap between the state in which the nucleus uh, was excited and the ground state. So this is a typical uh, action of uh, action flux. So the green uh, lines are monochromatic lines uh, generated by these couplings. Uh, we calculated this for neutron capture and proton and this one for lithium-7 excitation, the excitation to boron-10. Of course, you have to assume uh, here uh, certain values for the coupling. So you might think, okay, it seems like the, the, the flux is abundant, but it's a kind of a model dependent question. What is the size of, of the flux that you have there? It depends on how you choose your couplings. That statement, of course, is true. And that is actually the, the, the main point that in this kind of facilities, you are sensitive to certain couplings and certain masses, depending on the, on the amount of, of faults you end up producing. The overall conclusion is that uh, there are regions in which uh, the ALP uh, flux can be abundant, okay? And it's in those regions where this uh, experiment might play a, a good role. Now you produce the dyes and then you have to detect them. So you produce them in a reactor uh, and they reach the detector, assuming they have a sufficiently long, they are sufficiently long lived. So they reach the detector. Now, uh, in order to determine what kind of processes you can use for detection, we used was a kind of a minimality criterion. We said we want uh, to do detection with the same coupling that we use for production, and that defines our, our, our minimality criteria. Uh, if you do so, then you can sort the different uh, processes that will that will take place in, in both detection, production, and detections. If you go to GA gamma gamma, then you have prima call for production. You have inverse prima call for, for detection. Production and detection goes through uh, Primakov and inverse Primakov. And then, if you are sure that the <clears throat> ALP decays within the detector volume, then the byproducts of the decay of this guy within the detector can be used as well for detection. So, you have here uh, this uh, shape mark. If you go to couplings, uh, to uh, action electron couplings, uh, then you can use uh, Compton like for production. You can use inverse Compton like for production, two check marks here. But you have further processes. So you have actual electric absorption, which is the equivalent of uh, photoelectric absorption for radiation. That one doesn't enable you for uh, to to produce any, of course, any any uh, action or alp but enables you to do detection. So it increases the, 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 the possible uh, number of processes that you can consider for detection. You also can consider electron pair production in, in, in the field of, of the electron. Of course, not for production, for, but for detection. And again, if you, if you are sure that, that the ALP decays within the detector volume, you can also use the electron pairs produced in that process to uh, detect uh, action like particles and you can keep going okay so I, I will stop there you can also also say the same thing for for action nuclear nuclear couplings okay um i have here a comparison between uh, scattering and uh, and decay for in the case of ga gamma gamma couplings which i'm not gonna discuss i just want to go uh, uh to one of our main results which are sensitivities in the case of models in which uh, you have a dominant GA gamma gamma coupling. So there's, a, of course, a, a lot of bounds that, that you can place on this kind of objects in, in typically in the plane of coupling versus mass. So here I'm showing uh, constraints coming from cast Sumiko that we're looking for what is called uh, solar actions. There are also bounds coming from supernova 1987A, which are kind of the same, which follow same kind of the same arguments that I already pointed out in the case of neutrinos, and then you have also constraints coming from uh, stellar cooling arguments. 
And then uh, on, on kind of the region of high uh, actual light particle masses, it, you also have uh, experimental bounds that rely on laboratory, uh, laboratory searches, uh, beam dump experiments, lab, and so on and so forth. Now, this bounds over here, supernova, uh, HBS stars, and Castumico, they are not laboratory bounds in the sense that the search which is producing the OPS, if they are produced, are astrophysical sources. And in there, you can have environmental effects such that you by no means can produce the guy. So having uh, information from, from a laboratory experiment might enable testing the, the, the assumptions that, that you have behind the Casumica bounds, the HB star bounds, the supernova bounds, and so on and so forth. And then in here you have uh, this, uh, this kind of triangular spot. So this triangular spot uh, is subject to cosmological constraints as well, which uh, of course are subject to, to hypotheses. They are basically valid only in the Lambda CDM model. If you departure from the Lambda CDM model hypothesis, then this bound doesn't apply anymore. Basically, the bottom line of, uh, of this, uh, in particular of this of the sensitivities, so these are the sensitivities that we got, the, the, the black line is the sensitivity for what would be, a, for example, a detector such as cones, or a detector such as <clears throat> the detector that, that people in minor will use, or, or the detector that, that Texono will be using. While the, the blue curve over here is what uh, you will expect in, in a kind of distant future detector in which you, you upgrade the detector from a few kilograms to one ton and rather than using germanium, you use senior, okay? Under different background hypotheses. Now the main point, the, 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 the take home message uh, of this analysis is that in particular for this coupling, uh, this experiments, this reactor experiments, will be able to test the hypotheses behind uh, solar axioms, uh, HBS stars, and supernova 1987A limits on ALP uh, particles, and also will able will be able as well to test cosmological hypotheses uh, behind uh, this triangular region over here. Okay. So thank you very much for your attention. I don't have any conclusions because I already took uh, sufficient time. So I, I apologize for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Diego, for this nice presentation. Uh, so now we open uh, to the questions. Uh, you can make your questions just switching on the microphone or uh, type into this chat and I can read. Uh, so let me start with a, a question, Diego. Uh, can you back to the uh, that slide uh, about CP violation? Uh, CP violation here. Okay. Uh, which you have the deep uh, on the spectrum. Here? Yes. Okay. So in, in that plot uh, up the right, uh, what would you expect in, in this standard model? Uh, a flat spectrum? Uh, okay, the standard model spectrum. Uh, okay, so this calculation was done in for the sodium iodide detector. Now in the standard model, you will expect uh, something. Let me go here so the, to the liquid argon. So this is the this is the standard model expectation, the solid spectrum. Okay. Yeah. So the solid here is the standard model. Of course, it is it, not the same for for that it, that that the, the spectrum and sodium uh, iodide, but it, it gives you already a, an idea. So this yeah, is so what yeah. you expect in the standard model. So it works this way. So in the, in the standard model. Uh, the standard mole spectrum you expect to be uh, uh, per beam abundant at, at low recoil energies. And the reason is it has to do with the structure of, of the neutrino flux and the espalation neutron source. So in the espalation neutron source, 
the spectrum at low uh, at low neutrino energy at low neutrino energies is abundant, and as you approach a threshold and threshold in there is determined by kinematic reasons to be the mu mass over two, so it's about fifty MeV. As you approach fifty MeV, the the spectrum falls. And so that's the reason why you expect the standard model spectrum or any other spectrum in which you don't have any kind of uh, uh, destructive interference uh, to be more abundant toward lower uh, energy beams than towards uh, lower energy beams. Uh, sorry, uh, toward uh, higher energy beams. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and you. Can you uh, probe this uh, CP violation effects, these uh, deep signatures in, uh, for instance, neutrino electron is scattered in experiments? And neutrino neutrino, neutrino electron uh, is scattered in experiments. What's the difference uh, between neutrino electron scattered in and coherent neutrino nucleus in this case for probe? this uh, CP violating effect. No, in, pr in principle, you can have that as well in, uh, in neutrino electron scattering. So in principle, you can have that as well there. So there, there is not, at, at, that, at that level, uh, there is no difference between, uh, between uh, the effect. Uh, of course, quantitatively, there will be a difference, uh, but uh, from the qualitative point of view, uh, there is no difference between uh, sevens and neutrino electron scattering when it goes to CP violation encoded in new physics. The only single reason why uh, we ran the exercise uh, for neutrino nucleus is because uh, it was done for neutrinos producing the spallation neutron series. So we were relying on the detectors that they have there. And the detectors they have there, in particular, the sodium iodide and the liquid argon detectors are uh, detectors which are designed to enhance or, or to operate uh, around uh, uh, sevens, not around uh, neutrino electron elastic scattering. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. So, uh, more questions? Diego? I have another question, and you, uh, okay. I think I missed the, the connection between the uh, in the last part of the talk uh, in the action like uh, searches with the the coherent scattering. Uh, so, what's the connection? Is only the experimental environment that you are yeah. using, or, or something else? No, that, that, that's it, basically, tests you. So, uh, so re recall that, that I said, that I said um, in here, new physics and uh, new physics and new directions. Okay. Um, so new physics here means uh, new physics encoded somehow in the neutrino sector. New direction refers uh, to the fact that you can use these facilities not only for neutrino uh, physics, you can use these facilities as well uh, to search for particles which are completely decoupled from the neutrino sector, which is kind of, at the end, you know, after we ran the exercise, we thought like, okay, it's not surprising at all because uh, you can think uh, of other experiments that have done the same thing. So think about Borexino. So Borexino <clears throat> was an experiment designed for, for neutrino physics, but at the end, uh, they also did uh, solar action searches because uh, you can uh, easily adapt uh, the detector uh, to look for the signals that 
uh, solar actions uh, will induce. So here the point is, is that there's no connection in principle between uh, action like uh, particle searches and neutrino physics. Here the, the point is that you can use these facilities to do neutrino physics related uh, searches. So you can measure sevens for sure. You can, uh, for example, uh, uh, determine with a higher precision and at a lower renormalization scale the weak mixing angle. You can as well, for example, uh, as I pointed out, determine uh, uh, nuclear properties. You can look for new interactions in the, in the neutrino sector, but then you can go uh, beyond that you can look for actual light particles. So this is a possibility which is beyond uh, quotation marks, just uh, the neutrino sector. Okay. Because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not listening to you. Sorry, <laughs> I had switched off. Uh, there's some noise here uh, in my apartment. There's a, a washing machine turned on. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, uh, so my question is: uh, QCD axions are included in this uh, axion-like particle searches? Well, uh, yeah. So this is a good question. So uh, you can see in, in this sensitivity plot that I have here, I have a band. Okay. So this is stripped over here is what you expect uh, in, in QCD action molds. Now, in, in QCD action molds, uh, you have a connection between the, the action decay constant and the action mass, which you don't have in the case of action like particles. Now, my understanding, and this is just my understanding, uh, regarding what you pointed out, is that uh, for QCD actions in these regions, or in these regions too, uh, you would need uh, a QCD action uh, decay constant, which uh, is probably already ruled out. So I, I will regard this search as more appropriate for action like particle searches that for QCD action searches. Okay. I see. So more questions. The audience is very shy today. <laughs> uh, let me see here. Uh, so I'll keep uh, asking. I have a lot of, of questions. Okay. <laughs> um, so these uh, seven detectors are mostly single phase detectors, differently from uh, dark matter detectors, right? Yeah, these are. Th so uh, as far as I know, all of them are, are single phase. And uh, bear in mind that, that, so when you think about uh, uh, these dark matter detectors, as you said, they are, they are, these are two, two phase detectors uh, which rely on, on liquid xenon. Uh, when you think about uh, these uh, seven detectors, uh, first of all, um, let me go to the. To this list, for example. So all the red hundred and the expulsion, uh, sorry, the scintillation bubble chamber uh, will use uh, 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 liquid xenon. So it's, as far as I understand, it is for uh, for liquid xenon that, that you can kind of design this two faces, uh, this two phase uh, uh, detectors. Now this, uh, for example, uh, in here you have uh, 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 this uh, couple, charge coupled uh, devices or CCDs. So in CCDs you cannot 
I, I think you cannot have such a, uh, uh, such a performance, so to say, uh, uh, neither here, for example. So these are bol bolometers. So the, the, the detection technique here is pretty different. The detection, he the detection technique here is also very different. So all these uh, detectors uh, are, are, I mean, rely on a completely different, uh, and a completely different technique compared to those uh, based on a liquid uh, scene. On, or yeah, so yeah, that, that's that's the point. The, the threshold of these experiments. Are, Sorry. Are, can you Sorry. hear me? Yeah, yeah. And so uh, about the, the threshold of these uh, detectors, uh, the dark matter detector, detectors are have uh, lower uh, thresholds than the, these seven, seven detectors. Okay. Um, at, at coherent, the answer, if you, if you, if you think about the losing coherent, the answer is yes. So the dark matter detectors, uh, this multi-tone dark matter detectors, uh, yeah, particularly Xenon One T or 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 the next generation Xenon NT or Darwin, uh, can reach thresholds of order 0.3 keV. Now this other uh, this other um, uh, detectors at at coherent. Uh, have thresholds at 5 kV or so. Okay. Uh, now, when it goes to detectors that will be used in reactor experiments, those detectors in principle will beat by far those using dark matter. So Nucleus, for example, is expecting to have thresholds uh, of order 10 eV. And at the end, it, it, it somehow relates with, first of all, the technology that you will use, but on top of that, uh, the material that you are using as well. So reaching uh, uh, 10 EV with, with Xenon, I think, is can even probably regard it as science fiction. <laughs> uh, but uh, in, in the case of, uh, of lower or lighter uh, isotopes, then, then you, you can probably go to to smaller thresholds. If on top of that you add the new technology, uh, then uh, you have capabilities which, uh, at that level, which go beyond what uh, dark matter detectors can do. So these reactor experiments are, are, are very nice for that reason. Are nice because they will reach uh, very low thresholds, and on top of that, they will be operating at few meters from the from the reactor core. Now, uh, neutrinos uh, at, at reactors are abundantly produced. So at one gigawatt uh, power, nuclear power plant, in the core, you, you probably will produce something like 10 to the three uh, neutrinos. Uh, probably I have a, a plot, you know, just to not uh, get it wrong. I uh, have here the environments. Oh, these are the fluxes. Okay, anyway, so uh, I don't want to get committed with the exact number. The point is uh, the neutrino flux at the reactors is huge. Now, if you have a detector placed a few meters from the source, then you have a lot of statistics. Now, the main problem, as far as I understand, that these detectors face is related with background, because when you go close to the reactor, of course, you increase the statistics, you increase the number of events you are looking for, but you also pay a price. So there's a penalty and the penalty is background. So one of the problems that these experiments face is, is background. So backgrounds and, and, and reactor environments can be pretty nasty. Mm -hmm. uh, and since you are going very near to the to the reactor, then you have to make sure that you properly understand your background. Now, at coherent, the way of avoiding this background. So, bear in mind that all these experiments are are are, are experiments that have basically you no know, overburden. 
So these are experiments which are ran at, at near or at the surface. Okay, pretty near the surface. So, so there's a lot of uh, uh, of background there. Um, also incoherent, you know. Um, the point is that in coherent, you can run the detector. Uh, it's wishing on and it's wishing off the the proton beam. Mm -hmm. So you measure uh, how your detector responds uh, with the beam off, and then you ran with the beam on. Then you do the subtraction. And you get the signal. In a nuclear reactor experiments, is a bit more complicated because, uh, in particular, for those which use commercial uh, reactors, yeah, you don't have control of the operation. Yeah, on yeah the you cannot tell the electricity company, look, uh, let's leave <laughs> uh, half of the country without electricity because we want to do a neutrino measurement. Yeah, there's no way you can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. forget the power for the the people. Let's do focus only on science and uh, exactly. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So from that point of view. Um, uh, I would say that, uh, for example, Coney in Brazil, uh, I think it's Coney. Uh, for sure, it's minor, but I think it's Coney too. But I, 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 I just I might be wrong about that. Um, they are using research reactors. Okay, they are using research reactors, and with a research reactor, you can play more. Of course, there are people running in their their experiments, but it's different when you tell somebody which is running an experiment, "Look, I'm going to turn off the reactor for a while." And when you tell when you tell a, a city of two million, "Look, you are going to be without electricity for a, for a couple of days because we are running a funny experiment." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So from that point of view, uh, the you know, minor and 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 Coney might be in a in a different in a different shape, so to say. I, I know for sure that that Ricochet. I know that 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 Conus, uh, are using uh, commercial uh, power plants, so they have these constraints. You know, of course, there's a period at which reactors are turned off for uh, maintenance. Uh, and so they can uh, probably, you know, use that period, you know, to to see how how their how their detector behaves in the absence of uh, uh, of of of, uh, of burning, so to say, of of, of material burning. You know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. Anyone uh, want to to do a last minute question? Well, if not, uh, let's stop here. Uh, okay. I'd like to thank you again, Diego. Thank you a lot for, for accepting the invitation for giving this talk. Very nice. And yeah, uh, thank you guys uh, that watch it and see you next time. Okay, Tessio, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.